Chapter 5 The Discovery Tommy and the other developers are standing around the water cooler in the break room. Hey Tommy, how's life with your work girlfriend going? The developers all laugh together. Yeah, have you guys kissed yet? Ha ha. Very funny. We're just friends, guys, Tommy responded, trying to get the other guys to calm down a bit. More like friends with benefits. Yeah, it's very convenient that you guys spend so much time together. Seems like you guys have crushes on each other. Why don't you just get married already? Tommy feels some rage building out of frustration, and his face turns slightly red. Look, guys, it's true. He's blushing. Tommy lashes out. Yeah, guys, you totally got me. All Sam and I do is write passionate notes to each other. We even have a secret language where, did you get that new UI button implemented? Actually means, I pine for you deeply. All I do is daydream about our romantic life together. The room goes deadly silent. All of the developers are staring directly at Tommy. Tommy, feeling like he has them finally backing down, continues. Every time you see Sam and me together, I want you to think about how I have her wrapped around my little finger. You guys should be jealous about how all I have is her to myself, and you guys never, ever will have a chance at getting her. Tommy? Tommy's heart sinks. He dreads turning around. He knows what he's going to see. He turns as slowly as possible, trying to delay the pain that he knows is in store. When he turns around, he sees Sam's face. He can tell that she is hurt. How could you possibly say those disgusting things about me? About us? Sam, I'm sorry. Before he even gets to finish, Sam turns and runs out. Thanks, guys. Look at what happened because you're always such idiots. Tommy screams at the other guys as he leaves the room. We should have known better. Guys never just want to be friends. They always have ulterior motives. You should know better by now, Sam. Sam's conscience scolds her as she frantically tries to escape her embarrassment. First, our car breaks down, and now we have to deal with this. What a horrible day. Not wanting to be seen by anyone, she enters the door for the staircase that isn't really ever used by anyone. Wanting to walk off her pain, she goes down the stairs to see where they lead. When she gets to the first floor, there isn't a door to the lobby. There's only one that goes outside. There's a fire gate blocking some stairs going down into the basement. Well, I don't want to go outside, so I guess I can complete the stairs before going back up. As she gets to the bottom, she notices an old rusty door that is slightly ajar. I wonder what's in here. I guess I can explore a little more. Maybe there'll be some space for me to sit down for a little while and calm down. The door squeaks as Sam opens it. She returns it to a slightly open position and continues in. It's a medium-sized area, at least spacious enough for her to enjoy while she gathers her thoughts. The room's a little dark. As she searches around for a switch or a flashlight or any source of light, she hears the sound of a door closing. The small amount of light from the cracked door is now gone and she's entirely in the dark. What do we do now? Keep searching. After feeling around for a while, she finally finds a light switch. The overhead lights aren't much, many of the bulbs are out, and the working ones are dim. Sam approaches the door, trying to see what happened. The doorknob won't really turn, and she can't open the door. Banging on the door, she yells, Help! Help! Can anyone hear me? It's no use, Sam. We're surrounded by bricks and concrete, and no one uses those stairs. At least you'll get the alone time that you were looking for. Looking around the room, Sam notices a few things. There's a neatly made twin bed with green sheets. There's a small table with a lamp that unfortunately has no bulb in it. In the corner, there's an old bucket and a mop. Old newspaper clippings are hanging scattered around, pinned on the wall. There's a workbench nestled in the corner with a wall of tools hanging over it and a record player sitting on top. Wanting to see the newspaper articles, Sam walks across the room. As she's walking, she gets tripped up and begins to fall. Before her conscience has a chance to scold her for being her usual clumsy self, Sam is lying flat on the cold floor. 
The wind is knocked out of her, so she lays still and winces for a bit before she can even process what just happened. When she opens her eyes, she sees that she has landed next to the bed. She also notices that there's a box stored right underneath the bed. As she regains some of her composure, she crawls underneath the bed a little bit and pulls out the box. Wow, I wonder what's in here, Sam ponders while opening the box. There is a star-shaped metal on top of everything. Sam takes it and gently places it onto the bed. Next, she finds some old pictures. One is of a smiling young man with a stunning woman next to him. John and Sally, 1960, is written on the back of the photograph. She also finds several pictures of a young girl growing up. Some of them are labeled Jenny's First Steps, Jenny at the Pool. Jenny completes her first year of swim lessons. Jenny goes to prom. Standing up at the back of the box is a record by Paul Anka. The final thing Sam notices is an old, worn book. As she clears the dust on it, some writing is revealed. It says, Journal, Jonathan Browsley.